have enjoyed myself. And I am trying my best to communicate to those who are interested in this. In fact, it is my intention to sell physics here. Physics is a very beautiful subject, but often the way it is presented, the way you pick it up from newspapers, gives one an impression that is beyond the comprehension of many, and many drop out of physics for different reasons. It is my desire to see that people take physics and pursue it to make their own contributions to physics. In fact, today's topic could have been even titled as the magic of physics. Partly it's even Physics of magic also. It is because I want to capture your attention and trap you with what is interesting, what is enticing, but what is counterintuitive. Yet, it is in the domain of physics that you can easily understand and follow if you have had, had some education in physics. What is perplexing to a layman will not be perplexing to a student of physics. What is perplexing to a student of physics, hopefully will not be perplexing to a teacher of physics. What is perplexing to a teacher of physics, will not be generally perplexing to a physicist who is practicing physics. And what is practitioner in physics, why is difficult to comprehend, will not be perplexing to a specialist. So there is a hierarchy of our ability to appreciate, to understand and even to uh, find it difficult to follow. It depends upon the background knowledge that we have acquired. So don't have to be unhappy if you don't understand all of physics. On the other hand, it's enough. It's like a magic show. You are fooled from beginning to end. You wonder how these things happen. Good. That is a wonderful message that you will carry. At least the charm of physics as a magic I have to try my best to be a magician because I will not be able to convey the necessary physics effectively to everybody. What is the important definition of perplexity? If you open the dictionary, it says anything that is counterintuitive, anything that is unexpected, anything that appears to rebel against your understanding is generally categorized as a perplexing phenomenon. But as I told you, it could be perplexing to a layman and not to a student of physics. Uh, let me start with a very simple example. I am happy to present this to you because I saw this in an exhibition, a school exhibition. And I was one of the persons taken around. I was representing physics. There are two others, one biologist was there, one chemist was there, one mathematician was there, and we were supposed to evaluate these students and of course finally declare the prize. If so happened, I was also supposed to inaugurate that. So, it so happened I was deeply involved in this scientific exhibition, and the very first exhibit was very impressive to me. Fortunately, I understood that. But strangely, my friend who was a specialist in mathematics and my friend who was a specialist in biology found it amazing. They could understand that. The chemist sort of guessed the answer. In other words, what we see may not be clear to everybody all the time. So with that, I start this. Uh, how do you press it now? This is a film. Ah, that one. Can you switch off these lamps? These are two plates. Should 
picture of all the rest. That look identical. If you touch one, it feels warm. If you touch the other, it feels cold. Water plus alcohol. If it's 50% alcohol, it means it's 50% water, 50% alcohol. 
So the water gets the load. Alcohol is highly volatile. It catches fire, but it catches fire at a lower temperature. They're not high enough to boil away water. Water remains and is still a wet load. It can't catch fire unless all the water is driven out. Then it's a dry piece of paper which can catch fire. That never happened because much before that, alcohol would have burned. Alcohol is more volatile than water. Now, if this is given, the charm of magic is gone. I don't know how many will understand this reasoning. It's different. But this is a part of the magic show. And what happens behind this is a very important but elementary physics that we really recollect to appreciate this magic. The next one. This experiment was done by a little king. In fact, I saw this also done in one of the exhibitions. That's why I'm showing this. It's a small kid, and you see what he is doing. He is lighting a candle. That is the great about it. You can also light a candle easily. But then, you see what he is doing with a candle. His finger goes through the candle, the flame. Not once, to a satisfaction, a number of times. How is this possible? It's just one child. In fact, if anything, the skin should be more sensitive in the case of a child. The finger that goes through the flame. It looks fantastic. It looks quite perplexing to most of us. It's here the physics of flame becomes very important. Often we don't understand flame or we don't care to understand flame. That's why I show this to you to appreciate uh, the essential features of the flame. My next will transparency will tell you the essential uh, features of the candle flame. It has solid wax. You think this melts and through chemical reaction, wax is going there, it catches fire. Most of us think fire is there all through the volume. Actually, there is no fire in the center of the flame. The fire is only in the outer surface. Air is rushing in. Because hot gas is going out, air is rushing in. Air contains oxygen. Oxygen mixes with the high temperature wax and it reaches the initial temperature and it burns. Wax burns, resulting in Carbon dioxide. Oh, I want the full one. Ah. Uh, carbon dioxide. What's happening to me? Oh, I'm doing something now. Sir. Ah, good. Carbon dioxide in water. Inside, wax is not at a higher temperature at all. It's below the initial temperature. Inside, there's no flame. The flame is hollow. This flame is hollow. That's something that most people would have expected this. In fact, how to show that the flame is hollow? This is more like a theory. My next film will show that the flame is hollow. Next. Here's the candle. If it is hollow, I put a mesh, a white glass, over the flame. Can you go back again? Let them see. From the beginning. Just too fast to fill. Please look carefully. You see, it's all inside. Can you repeat it? That's beyond. It is somewhere here that you find. Ah, you see the center of it. It is not burning. It is hollow. 
But how could we do this? The mass is made of a metal. Metallic wire. It takes away heat. So, above that, there is not enough temperature. It is not hot enough for the wax to get ignited. So, we have stopped the flame here itself. Above the mesh, there is no flame at all. In fact, the candle flame is not a volume flame. It is a surface flame. It is only a level that is burning. And inside, it is wax. And air is rushing in. Because air is rushing in, the lower portion of the flame is pretty cold. So if you take the finger through the flame, the temperature is not high enough at all. It won't hurt you. You should not take your finger above the flame. Then, the process of burning with an exothermic reaction has a lot of heat coming out of it. But down below, the cold air is rushing in from all over. Because hot air is going on, it is being replaced by the air, cold air current. And therefore, the lower half of the film, I'm sorry, flame, is pretty cold. And you can take your finger through that. So this is, uh, this essence, or if you want to say, the mystery behind <coughs> finger being taken through the flame. When you have such a kind of flame, what you can easily get is soup. And you can put, have a spoon over the flame and cover that into a black spoon like this. But you lose that black spoon in this jar of water. You see? This is jet black. Now, you see? It's shining. Or here it was just that. Earth's surface. But now it is as though Sooth has disappeared. Sooth has not disappeared. In spite of that, if you take Sooth out, it will be uh, as it was earlier. As black as that. Why is this so? Now, I am in a different domain of physics, namely optics. First of all, I must tell you why this looks so black. And how come under water that coloration disappears altogether? Next. So there is nothing but carbon particles that are settled on the spoon. This is the spoon. Light falls on a carbon particle. Most of it is absorbed because it is black. And what little is reflected or scattered is absorbed by other pieces. So hardly any light comes out. All the light falling on soon is finally completely absorbed. That's how it is when it is in the air. Now next, when you dip this under water, a very sophisticated physics comes into play. Water is a liquid. Now these are little particles. A liquid is what is called surface tension. Surface tension prevents it from seeping into these little crevices. So it stands as a film. So there is air here, there is water there. And any previous student knows that when light enters from a more denser medium like water into the air, there is total internal reflection. That is what is happening here. Light does not reach carbon particles at all. Light is being simply reflected by the water air boundary. That's how we don't see the suit. It looks silvery. That doesn't mean suit has disappeared. It doesn't mean suit has become transparent. It only means the water film is reflecting all the light back, giving the wrong impression that it is not any more jet black. Now, you are into summer holidays, so I am suggesting a project. Go through this project. Here is a design. We will finally work out a wonderful illusion out of this design. So you press this on a sheet of paper. For example, it can be a very big one. You can print each one of them. See, so these hundreds of pieces are ice cream for kids. It's 
spend a little money so that you are keep pleased with this. So you have as many sheets as possible which covers the entire design. Now you glue them together. Take out the useless parts. Then you have to fold them. It becomes a box. That's what is going to happen. Finally it is a box. Nothing more than that. So to make it a box, you have to cut up one the various regions. This is the window. I am trying to construct inside what is called a, a room for a child to look at. So this is the room, this is the window of that room. So now you fold all this back, it becomes a box. It has a door, windows and what not. So it is a very highly distorted box. It's a very easy summer project. Actually, this is done by an Indian boy. That's why I'm showing you this. This is a specific significance to all of you here and to me also. So fold all this. It is about a 15 inch size. Now it's on the tape. You glue it up. It is a box. Nothing more than that. It is a trapezoidal box. It is not a rectangular box. It is not a square box. It is a trapezoidal box. Now, you look through the little hole that you had made in one of the walls. This is how the scenery will look. Now take an object from this end to that end. Can the size go up? You see? The size went down as it went to that side. Too far. This is bigger than that. And that becomes bigger and bigger. This becomes smaller and smaller. Very interesting, usually. I, I hope you all saw this. You know for certain that this is not right. The pen has the same size as you go from this here to that hand. The plane card must be the same. What? Are you being cheated? That's why it's called magic. See, this is a strange part of the optics of vision. The box is distorted. But the line doesn't Take this torch and it call, it covers that entire rectangular room. So the trapezoidal box is like a rectangular room like this. So the distortions disappear. <laughs> That's how the eye views at this. And in that, this was a very tall wall. That was a very short wall. So when something went from this end to that end, proportionately it was bigger relative to that. But the eye has put this to the same size but doesn't know what to do with the object. They will discharge the object as it goes from this here to that here. It is because the object is going farther or nearer as it moves in the room. Therefore, the relative dimensions of the room have disappeared and distortions have disappeared and it become a beautiful rectangular box. In place of that distortion, the objects get distorted as you move from place to place. This is called Amy's room. And I want to share some, some personal experience I have with this. I talked about this long ago, some 25 years ago, in the Bangalore Planet, uh, Industrial Technical Museum for Kids. And I suggested that they should make an Amy's room, either as a product for kids, or they make one so that everybody enjoys whoever visits the idea. Somehow, when I had been born myself, therefore I had a lot of confidence in that. I told them that I would even help them. But they didn't touch you, they didn't trust me. Now, almost every one of you can do this. It is a very good summer project to bring out an essential fallacy in our interpretation of the world. The distorted room doesn't appear distorted at all. On the other hand, objects that move from place to place in this room get distorted. That is, and the beauty of it. You see? So big. And that is so small. Now this becomes bigger. That, that becomes smaller. But actually, it is the room that is distorted. And not the object. That's how it is. So, it is the relativity of the object and the space in which the object appears. This will trouble us again. Next. This has been made of even films. Optics that this room I have written. This is a distorted room. This is longer than that. It's a very simple distortion. 
Otherwise, it is rectangular. Now, this object goes from this here to that here. It is farther from you. Therefore, it should appear smaller. This will appear bigger, it will appear smaller. But the eye doesn't think it is going that way. The eye thinks it is going exactly perpendicular to your vision. The eye thinks your, it is going like this, though it is going that way. So physically it is going along that side, therefore the size is shrinking because it is going farther from the observer, yet the eye interprets as though the person is walking parallel to this wall and this or the car size or the object size is decreasing. This is the most elementary uh, understanding of projections and its implication in vision. Next. It's a very beautiful illusion that appeared in Central America long, long ago. You see it in the part of a movie here. Here is the second ball with the grey and black squares. I don't have to explain much here. Everything is self-descriptive here. See, these two appear to be of the same grey shape. But look at this. She has taken this square to that side, it is dark. She will bring it back and it will become grey. See? How could this be? You see? It will go back and it will become black. It is the same sheet of paper that is going from this end to that end. Here it is grey, there it is black or dark. Why is this so? It is simply because when this piece of paper is grey. When grey is surrounded by darker objects, the eye subtracts out the background. Grey is black plus white. And background is black, when subtracted that, good lot of black disappears from grey, so it appears whitish. When grey is taken to the water region, why is this taken out of that? So, dark plus white, why it is taken out, it appears darker. Because the eye subtracts the background, the object appears to be having a color that is different because there is a mixture of two colors. This is a very a interesting uh, illusion that was demonstrated, but it happens all the time in nature. And Apparently, it is very important for animals to recognize against, for example, a green background, a fruit that is almost greenish, but not green. Then you have to subtract the background, then that fruit will appear with a different color. It will easily go and catch that. This is how it evolved uh, in the animal world, and we yeah, are animals in many more of these days. So, I will show you another version of this with color. Keeping the animal world in mind. Next. That, that's enough, I think. Here is a picture of banana. And you know it is, uh, I think it's very fast. Can we start again? A picture of banana, it is. Start all over again. Probably people will see, I will have to describe it. This appeared in 2011, new scientist. Yellow, keep on this, a blue plastic, everything appears greenish. Now you replace that blue plastic by a white blue plastic. Check out that. Now you see yellow again. It is because the background blue has been subtracted. What appeared as greenish is yellow plus blue. Now when the background is blue, blue is subtracted. So it appears yellow and it is said that this is how animals make fruits in nature. When it is camouflaged by leaves and so on. The leaves are green, the fruit may not be exactly green. It may be greenish. That will be sting if literally that color is taken. But if supplied the background out, green will disappear from the fruit, it will be slightly yellowish and the animal can easily get. This is how in nature uh, we have found this part of uh, our 
you should be being parted, being subtracted by the ground, and then make out what the color of the object is. It is like to use a very huge language, finding a signal in a noise. Take out the noise, the signal will stand out. You see, it's greenish. Now I am placing that. It is not in the word greenish at all. It is yellowish. Because it is subtracting that background. Uh, it appeared in 2011, just three years back, in New Zealand. It was considered a very important work for the year. Next. Next. Now I will go to mechanics from heat, from the optics. Now we go to mechanics. Probably you have seen this at a match. Here is a leg cap. Here. In a cup. How to take the egg out? Of course, you can take it out with your fingers. Then there is no great physics in that. Now look at this. Slowly. You will see what you will do. Because this is like magic again. But counter it did, therefore it is perplexed. I don't have to say much, everything is obvious. You blow the air and it comes out, you see? So you don't have to suck here to suck the air out. You blow there, the air comes out. Can we start somewhere here? In the, not in the beginning because it takes a lot of time so that they will see somewhere. It actually jumps out of that vessel. Ah. Is it late at all? Then I think, oh, well, something is happening. Why is it not running? <coughs> it should be running. No, but it cannot run from the beginning. Yeah, 
gets in through the crevices and the pressure builds up. And so much pressure builds up that it kicks the egg out of the cup. This is uh, elementary fluid dynamics if you want to call it. But then the charm of it, it is counterintuitive. Most people don't think that it, you should blow down to get the egg out of the cup. Yes. Uh, up to what time? Please, uh, I, I don't want to. I show you just in the day. This is another one which you might have seen somewhere. I saw this in the exhibition in Bangalore, science exhibition again. And two of my friends did understand and appreciate. This is just a scale. In fact, the biologist was amazed by this. That doesn't speak low of him. He, he, he did not know that part of physics to appreciate this. So, just to keep a piece of paper on that, nothing more. That's all. This is an experiment that you can do yourself. Most of what I have shown you so far, you can repeat yourself. Good. So the scale is under the piece of paper. Normal paper. It is not any great paper either. See? The scale is broken. I thought paper is very light. Scale is pretty hard. Yeah, it is an extraordinary demonstration of air pressure. Paper is one continuum. Air active on that. Area times the pressure is the net force. Against this force, your blow is nothing. This will break. The scale will be held in place by the air pressure. While your own blow is short enough to break. This is a very beautiful demonstration of air pressure. In fact, so much so, the balanced uh, who was with me said we should be the first pressed to this. Of course. The boy got the first prize. I say the boy, because there were also girls in that exhibition. Just for fun, I thought I would show you again. Unbelievable! Unbelievable fun. Paper is so light and so fragile. It is to tear paper. Its scale is pretty hard, it is wood. And you see what happens? Breaks. Good sir, next. Next experiment. In fact, I'm sorry to say, many scientists have not answered this. Therefore, I want to show it to you. So, actually, here's a scientist, actually, he's a physicist, who wants to weigh A. He has weight. The first sentence, I'm sorry, first lesson we learned in high school. If A has weight, I will do the most obvious experiment. Fill up a balloon with A and B. Take out A and A. What's wrong with that? That's what you would do. How do you find the weight of this? Without anything on the pad, you know the reading, it let it be zero. Keep this on the pad, not the reading. The difference gives you the weight of this. Good. That is what he is doing, accepting. Here you cannot keep as it is. You have to contain it in some vessel, and that is this. Now, he punctures this. You have not heard it. He has recorded the weight. It is 10 point something, and now we will let the air go out so that the balloon doesn't have any air. In fact, actually, this has been done by a physicist. He is quite a well known person who popularizes physics. And if you hear a commentary, and you will record it again, it is the same. There is no change in the reading at all. The reading is the same within the accuracy of the instrument. That is all. How could this is the same? It means air has no weight. Then the question is posed to everything around. There are many scientists that I talked to. You will see that in the very pieces also did that. This is one thing that will amaze anybody, including scientists, because I have four scientists with this. The answer is a very beautiful demonstration of bias.
That's all. What is outside that alone is air. It is an object of a certain shape. When you put that object of a certain shape, if you get an upward thrust, it is equal to weight of the air displaced. Weight of the air displaced is nothing but the weight of the air that is inside the balloon. The two are the same. They get completely composite. If you are replaced here by oxygen, answers will have to different. But if you let the element be oxygen and do the experiment in oxygen and element, again nothing will happen. Because the weight of the displaced gas is equal to the weight of the gas inside. It so happens in the air outside and the air inside, therefore the downward load that we experience in the air or there is completely compensated by buoyancy. So the reading is as though the air was not there all the time. This is the uh, beautiful elementary explanation for this demonstration. Air has no weight, that's what he said. Good, next. This you might have seen, yet I would like to show this to you. Since the answer is not given at the end, it poses a problem to you. I will answer this in the end. These are yet. You can remember that most of the things are comfortable. Probably every one of them you can do yourself. Satisfy that I am not talking uh, of high growth physics that is done in a very sophisticated lab where growth of rupees are necessary to start your experiment. A very simple experiment. These are yet placed in the crates and the chap is working on them. How is it possible? You know how soft the earth is? If you take a leg and step on it, it's gone. So very soft. Share your conclusion on how you think this happens. This is where we have to distinguish between what is called the force acting and the stressor, the stress. Stress is force per unit area per pressure. Yet by itself is not a very strong object. If you stand on it, it will get cut because your entire weight in the language of physics Mg is acting on it, it's stiff, therefore it can't stand that weight. But when there are 100 legs, your weight is spread over the two legs in a bigger area and each leg gets only maybe 100 times, 150 and It is strong enough to stand that. So this is a beautiful example to distinguish between force and stress. Often uh, there are definitions on a blackboard, but here is a demonstration that as long as the stress is within the elastic limit of the air, it will stand that. You have spread your way across very many X. So each one gets only a small fraction of your way, which by itself can crush a single year. Next. Switch off this lamp. Now we have to see something. These two lamps. I would like to sh show what's happening here. Switch off. Huh. Can you start that all over again? Ah, did you see the lighting of the fluorescent lamp? Start all over again. The fluorescent lamp. Up. And what is being brought near that is a balloon. You have rubbed that balloon against your head. Hey. So the balloon has been electrically charged. Now the electrically charged balloon is brought near that and it lights up as though a fluorescent lamp would light up in your house. How is this possible? You are sending 210 volts and trying to light up a fluorescent lamp. But here, it is just something that you are doing with your hand with a rubbed balloon. Of course, you rub the balloon so that it gets electrostatically charged. You call it. Good. Yes. Two things are necessary. How can we understand this? Electric discharge demands high voltage. 
that electric fixture is a, a, a classroom lesson. And the teacher says, high voltage supply between the two electrodes so that there is a discharge. What is this high voltage? He is holding it in his hand, nothing is happening. It is not even like you are output in a house where it is about 200 watt volts. That is the charm of the electrostatics. The balloon has been charmed by rubbing it against you, my head. Next. This is the charged balloon, it is carrying a negative charge. And now, there are always, there is a gas inside the fluorescent lamp. And always there are ions inside, positive and negative ions are It is because of cosmic rays, all the time, bombarding us from all over. So some atoms are always ionized. So, because of that, the positive ions go up, negative ions are pushed beyond, because of the charge. But that by itself tells you much. That is necessary. But then you saw the boy moving back and forth, moving hither and thither, the balloon. Then, as that moves, this starts moving because the distance between the charges will vary, the electric field will vary, so these charges will start moving up and down, they call it of gas. So this is very much like what is in the discharge tube. The ion goes back and forth, positive or negative ion. It erases other atoms and so on. So it lights up the way you would light up here. Yes. Next. So here is a cup of water. That's all, nothing but water. A plastic truck with water. It's better you have a transparent cup, it could be even made of glass, and there's a piece of magnet. The top surface could be the north pole, the bottom surface could be the south pole. It doesn't matter which way you place it. You keep that magnet there, and you see something fantastic. Water has not spread over that. Actually, this has sunk inside water. Yet, water has not engulf that. You see, he presses it and water gets out. It's not possible. He's arguing that a lot of sleep. But if it's not a magnet, if you keep any other material, it will suddenly sink inside and water will be over this. Because the height of water is above that the magnet. Look at this. The side view is all the more spectacular. Water has risen up. The magnet has sunk inside. There is a wall of water all over. And it is coming out. You see? It is coming out. The way Vasudev was supposed to have got the ocean separated when he carried Krishna. See, as though it is separated out. The river and the you know. You see, it is separated out. How can this be so? It is a magnet. Normal banter. See, this is something that is not emphasized in the classroom, though essays are written, parts are scored, buttons are wired. There is one property named the diamantism. It is universal. Every material is diamantic. Diamantic means if this is a magnet and if there is a diamantic, by bringing this magnet near that, that develops an opposite polarity. If they are not poor, they are also not poor. If this is so poor, they are also the so poor. It induces in that material opposite magnetization. This is diamagnetism. And no material is an exception to this. Even water is a diamond. What happened is, this water developed a pole with exactly like this not pole, they are not pole repent. It's getting repent. You get this water, it will disappear. Because magnetism will disappear above a certain temperature called the fluid temperature. So here the beautiful property, the magnetic property of water that can be demonstrated, that magnetism, most of the time, that magnetism, the textbook stuff, meant to be written on the blackboard, copied in the notes, reproduced in the exam, where the demonstration of it. People go to Guya Palace in a pocket of heaven, it's not necessary. You can do it at home. Just a cup of water in a transparent cup and a magnet. You can buy magnets easily these days. 
So here is a beautiful demonstration of the magnetic property of water. It is so easily available in the dam. Because dam and dam is a, it's not peculiar to only water. All materials are diamond. In fact, the, the lead of the pencil is very highly diamond. So much so, if you have landed, if you keep that properly, it can be built to float, that can be magnetic levitation. I have a beautiful movie of that, I have not brought it here. You can see that pencil, lead, circular floating in air, because this magnet has produced the opposite polarity on graphite. Graphite is very highly diamond. It's as though the levitation is actually diamond levitation. Next. This is another one. This probably can be done only a middle class home because only they probably have micro ones. You can't expect this in a village. Every other experiment can be done in the village according to me. See? Put the light bulb the right side up in a cup. That's how it is. Keep it inside the micro oven and set it. For 45 seconds. Second, five seconds is what we generally. You see, you light it up. I think if you switch off this light, it will be better. Switch off these lights. Light. Switch off. Everyone will see these things better. I think as far as possible, switch off these lights. Ah, start all over again. Let them see. It, it lights up. Earlier, I lit up a fluorescent lamp. Now I'm lighting up a normal tungsten filament lamp. So it is a microwave oven, a cup of water, a bulb, microwave, fill the cup three-fourths full with water, place the bulb like this with the other end, yeah. right side up, keep it inside the microwave oven, put the bulb in, set the timer for 45 seconds, you see? It's lighting up. It will be very hot. You should be careful. When you open it, you should be careful. It will be very, very hot. How can we understand this? We have seen that it is being cooked inside a microwave. Because that which has water will absorb the microwave, it will get hot and so on. You know, water and so on here. It's a wonderful demonstration of the electromagnetism that we teach to. A microwave is an electromagnetic wave. It is electric and magnetic field is going back and forth. Now, it can go through glass. So it goes through the cover of the bulb, there is a tungsten filament. Now, the tungsten filament is a piece of wire, metallic wire. The electric field is oscillating outside because it's an electromagnetic wave. So it is forcing the electron back and forth inside this tungsten wire. It is like an oscillating current. And it's heating up this. The way the normal tungsten filament lamp heats up because of an AC current going through it is happening here. Except if you're not supplying AC, it is getting locally generated by the electric field of the electromagnetic field. But so much heat is generated that it may even burst if you don't take the heat out. Otherwise, you should keep it in a cup of water because it will expand the gas and the bulb may give away. So far, I learned in a short time. I talked about examples from the domain of heat, light, mechanics, electricity, and magnetism. If you have carefully <coughs> watched my examples, all of them are very simple experiments which can be undertaken at home, let alone the laboratory. You don't need a laboratory. But the charm is wonderful. Ties have been made using these principles. These ties are equally puzzling, equally perplexing. They have become very famous also. So I will end my talk with some of these ties. Please bear with me. I don't know what I have a role. Uh,
time. No, no, no problem. I have till some more time. Good. Next. Uh, okay, let's start from the beginning. Let's start from the beginning. Switch off the lights completely. All the lights will switch off. All the lights are not. But this is called a Chinese magic mirror. Here is a metal. It's an alloy of copper and many other things whose secret is not known very well. On the back of it, there is imprinted the 12 signs of the zodiacal sign. It could be any other picture. It is embossed on it. The other side of it has mirror finish. You can see your image. You can see the image of this man's hand. So very shiny is a mirror finish. On this side, on this side, they have embossed a pattern. Now light falls on that. Look at what is behind this metal piece is appearing in the reflected light. Light falls on the mirror finish you made. Yep, you see this. Can we go through it again? Yeah. Ah, yes. See, this is. So he is banging it so that you know it is a metal. It's very shiny. So you are not being treated. So this is what at the back of the behind embossed. It's some picture. Now light falls on the shining piece and the is projected onto a wall. It could be a screen, it could be anything. Just look at the reflected light. It looks easy to start with, but as you adjust the distance, they focus in the balance beautifully. Oh, that was behind has appeared the friend. How is this possible? My dear friends, it is still an unsolved problem. Such mirrors were made nearly 300 to 400 years ago in China. They have been there all the time. And you know, now papers are being written on how one can see what is behind the metal piece by reflecting light from the other end, which is very smooth. There is a simple model due to a very eminent man in optics, Sir Michael Berry, who is in Bristol. He said six years ago, or I think about eight years ago, he wrote a paper. He says, what is imprinted on this side is during the process of making the piece. And you have to polish the other hand. You know? When they polish it, gradually the dimples on this side are carried to that side and there are small replica. The height is so small and the eyes cannot make out. But the light can reveal. This is the theory that he has proposed and most people appear to accept this. Otherwise, there is no simple physics that I can present here or present anybody, including other worker physics, to convince him. But the magic remains. There is a way it is called the Chinese magic mirror. It is a metal piece, there is a embossed a pattern, it is very shiny, light falsely. It is reflected onto your wall. On the wall you find a pattern that is behind this. This is not a glass piece. It is something like brass. So it is a spectacular toy, if you have to call it metamathic. It has a very perplexing property. And no one is very clear of what that is to do. Next. My next topic. We will go to the next one. This is a plus toy. But the most amazing thought, start all over again, it is a very long spring, nothing more, raise it. You see the other end is keeping quiet, raise it again. They have left it. This has not moved at all. What's happening? Why well, gravity is not a subject itself? The whole spring is collapsing. Only after the collapse is complete, it starts going down. There is a very sophisticated physics. Going with this, you see, he has just released it. As long as he held it in his hand, it was a straight spring. The weight of the spring had pulled it. But the moment he released it, everybody would think that the straight spring would go down and also would get compressed. 
They have the answer that anyone would give. But look at this. It's not that. It gets compressed first. Completely. <coughs> and then it goes down. This, my dear friends, is according to me a very beautiful demonstration of what Einstein proposed. Namely, a free falling body doesn't have gravity. The moment the spring is released, it is a free falling lift. There is no gravity in it. When there is no gravity, a spring should immediately compress itself. And it is compressing. The object is also coming down. But the spring is of such a length, such a elastic thing and so on. The amount by which it contracts is equal to the amount by which it comes down. And the two are balanced at the end. It is a very beautiful time. But it is not easy for this, anyone to make this. That is why I say it is a very beautiful perplexing toy. Next. This is another beautiful toy that probably is no available in the market. You see, here is a world ball standing on a mirror. See, it's standing around. Can you go back? Oh, it's standing around, you see. What shape? Ah, it's turning around. Anyone can see this object is turning around. It is the image of that. It is so very uh, realistic. Now this man tries to pick it up with his forceps. Now he cannot. He cannot. He cannot pick it up at all. Deep inside. It is the beauty of this toy. It is inside. But the whole imaging process is said that the virtual image is here, exact replica of the object. These are two parabolic mirrors. This is the object. Light goes from here, gets reflected, reflected back, and then the other focus. An object at this focus gets imaged at that focus. And it is a three-dimensional image of the object. You never get a true three-dimensional image. An object anyway, except in holography. That's why this is often called the hologram. The hologram. Because this is a true three-dimensional way. All the rays starting from that result in the image thing. The image looks so realistic that this is often called the virtual reality. In fact, I should confess, I was fooled by this. I went to uh, a scientist actually fooled me. It was a pig that was there. In fact, this is also called pig illusion. He asked me, pig until you pig. I simply went and started thinking. I could get it. Then it occurred to me, possibly this is the case. I was not very sure of my answer. He said, You are right. Actually, there are two parabolic mirrors. One with a hole near the focus on the other. And the object is at the other focus. The object gets imaged at this focus. And this three dimensional object gets imaged into a three dimensional image. You don't get a three dimensional image anyway, except in here. And it's so three dimensional. As you turn the mirror, the image also turns, giving you the impression of solidity. You are fooled completely, but it is really the virtual image of the object. Good. This is elementary optics, but sophisticated technology has resulted in that. Now, this toy became very prominent. Start all over again. Start all over again. I would like to tell them here is a magnetic platform. <laughs> then there is a magic